Hey everyone, in today's video, I am here to share three literacy practices you should stop doing now in your K through two classroom and what you might wanna try instead. Now, before I even dive into this video, I am here to tell you I have done all three of these practices in my teaching career. You may have retired some of them a long time ago. You might still be doing one or two of them, or you might be like, yeah, Susan, I already know all this. Wherever you are at, it is a-okay. This video is just here for me to share some of the research I've been learning over the past few years and maybe give you some ideas or techniques for trying something new. And if you already don't do these in your classroom, then just give yourself a nice pat on the back and move along to some of my other videos. In fact, here's a whole phonics playlist you can check out. If you are ready to watch this video, give this video a like, subscribe to my channel, and let's just dive in. Right, literacy practice number one to nix from your classroom is popcorn reading. Now, this is the one I retired the longest ago, but in case you don't know, popcorn reading is when you have students either in a small group or a whole group, and they go around one by one reading aloud to the class. Now, this could be in order, so maybe they know what order they're going in, or this could be you coming over, tapping them on the shoulder, letting them know it's their turn to read. And the whole thought process behind it is that the students are supposed to follow along while another student is reading, and then when it is their turn to read and you tap them on the shoulder or call their name or whatever it is, they popcorn and it's their turn to read aloud. Now there are decades worth of research to share why this strategy isn't necessarily effective and in fact can be harmful to students. Number one, for your struggling readers, it definitely causes a lot of anxiety as they are kind of forced to read aloud to the class at a text that's not really at their level. And number two, for all readers in your classroom, it actually weakens comprehension. So instead of them getting to listen to you doing a modeled read aloud where you are showing proper fluency and your voice is rising and you're maybe modeling questions. If all the students in your class have to listen to someone who might be reading too slowly, or if you are interrupting to help somebody with a word, it slows down and weakens comprehension of the entire text. Two of my favorite strategies to try instead include whisper reading. Whisper reading has been around for a long time, so usually when students are reading their own text, it might all be the same decodable text that you're having them kind of decode. Even if some of your students are struggling with it, they're only whispering reading to you and their goal is to whisper read and then you kind of like lean in and listen to one student at a time and since all students are doing it not everyone has to listen to one student putting that spotlight on them which might cause them to be a little more anxious so whisper reading is one option but another great option for whole group reading is choral reading now choral reading similar to popcorn reading everyone in the class would have the same grade level text but instead of students reading it one by one you actually all read it together together with you, the teacher. The teacher is also reading it together. This helps already skilled readers practice their fluency aloud with a, you know, model like the teacher who's already doing it because they're following along and modeling your fluency and your intonation as you read. So this gives them great practice, but it also boosts the confidence of some of your struggling readers as well. Since the whole class is reading as one, they aren't singled out if they don't know a word or a phrase. They can simply lower their voice or even drop out for that part and join in where they know what they're reading. For them, this is more similar to a read aloud, but they are getting to practice reading along with you, but they also get to hear your modeled expression. Choral reading is also a great scaffold for those struggling readers to really have access to more difficult texts. For example, if there are a few passages you really want to go over with your entire class, you can send off different groups of students to go read it with a partner or go read it independently, but then you can pull a small group and you can all choral read it together before you have them go off and read it on their own. That way they've already had that practice with you as the teacher. You could help them with any tricky words, kind of front load them with any background knowledge they might need, and then they still get that chance to access it independently like the rest of their peers. If you don't do choral reading, it is a great one to try out, especially in first and second grade. Literacy practice number two to stop is going to be saying good readers and good writers. Now this one was hard for me. I definitely used good readers do this, good writers do that. That phrase in so many of my lessons, I'm pretty sure I had it up on anchor charts and everything. I don't know exactly where it started, but it was definitely something that was very prevalent when I first started teaching and that just kind of stuck with me. But in reality, if we are bombarding our students with these phrases of good readers do this, good readers tap out all the sounds and blend the sounds together. 
What that does is if a student doesn't do that, or if they are not getting it right, all it does is tell them that they are not a good reader or a good writer. It can really mess with their identity and it's really such an easy fix to make as the teacher, but it's one that you have to keep top of mind, especially if, like me, you were used to saying it all the time. To help change this one up, you can either take out the word good completely and just say readers do this and writers do this, or you can just keep it specific to that skill. You don't need to use that phrase at all. If you're teaching students how to make an inference, you can simply say, to make an inference, this is what we might do. Or when you're reading a text and the author doesn't explicitly tell you something, but there's more going on, you can use your schema and text evidence to make an inference. I basically just say the entire sentence without saying good readers do this. So that's just something to think about going forward. And literacy practice number three to rethink is teaching comprehension strategies in isolation. Now, I don't know about you, but in the past, I have definitely planned out weeks at a time where we are going to focus on a main idea, and then we are going to focus on how to make an inference. We are going to focus on questioning. And all these strategies are reading strategies we want our students to learn and apply, but we don't necessarily want to just teach them in isolation, and we don't just want to teach them once and then move on to the next one. But instead, we really need to teach them in combination with things like building background knowledge, and contextual knowledge, front-loading vocabulary before we go into a text. We don't want to spend so much time talking about these comprehension strategies alone, but instead we really want to talk about them as a whole with the text that we are reading. It's been found that if you teach these strategies just in isolation, they don't necessarily transfer across context, text to text. Instead, it's like, oh, okay, I understand what this passage is reading that Ms. Jones is teaching me. Here's the main idea. And they only can find the main idea by walking through those steps that I taught them in the text I provide that time. It doesn't mean that when they go on to a new text, they're going to follow each of those explicit steps and find the main idea. Does that make sense? Now, I feel like I should state again that we should not just be throwing these comprehension strategies out the window. In fact, they are very important, but instead of just making a whole unit on teaching main idea and then moving to the next one, what we should really be doing is spending a lot of time focusing on rich text, giving our students access to rich text, and spending a lot of time dissecting that text. And that would include doing things like building background knowledge before we even dive into it, front-loading that vocabulary like I mentioned earlier, then reading it with the class numerous times, talking about the content within that passage or within that text to really give students a much broader and deeper understanding of what's going on, instead of just giving them a text and trying to have them zoom in and find that one little main idea. Then when you're diving into a nice, rich text with your kids, you can practice things like finding the main idea, asking questions to figure out what's happening in a text, making inferences. All of those will be modeled through you, and again, you can teach them to do it, but all within this larger text. All right, so there were three literacy practices you should stop doing now in your classroom, along with some ideas and activities you might wanna try for a more effective literacy block with your students. I would love to know from you guys if you have stopped using any of these in your classroom, and if your students have really benefited from some of these newer practices, let me know down in the comments. As always, I do hope you enjoyed this video and it gave you a little something to think about. If it did, please give this video a thumbs up so I know you liked Liked it, subscribe to my channel and click that bell. That way you're notified of all my new videos. See you in the next one. Bye.